Okay. I think it's about 2.15 and people have kind of stopped trickling in. So um, we'll get started. And the lights will go down momentarily to make this easier to read. Um, my name is Narayan Newton. Uh, I am one of the system administrators for Drupal.org, and I've just been around doing system administration and performance work in Drupal for a while now. Can't hear you? Okay. I was warned about the directional nature of this mic. Uh, how's that? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, uh, my name's Narayan Newton. I'm a system administrator for Drupal.org. I've done performance in Drupal for a while now. Um, and this is actually one of the first presentations in quite a while that I'm excited about um, because it's not a normal presentation like the ones I've done in the past. Like I've done a lot of presentations talking about it, specifically very high performance situations like trying to configure MySQL to absolutely saturate IO devices and how to deal with a MySQL server that you want to be incredibly concurrent in a vertical way or how to take a site and make it concurrent in a horizontal way and scale it out horizontally. Um, and this is not that. This is a much more, a much more practical application and is much more me explaining my process in coming to a site that is performing poorly and how I deal with that, the steps I go through to do that, and why I think it's a good idea to do it very, very iteratively and with a methodology you strictly stick to. Um, and I'll try to explain the reasons behind that. Um, basically, like I work with a lot of people, and a lot of them are extremely good at exactly what I'm good at. Like the skills of knowing how to do APC, knowing how to configure Apache, configure MySQL, uh, use Xdebug and web grind to go through a site, use uh, MySQL slow log analysis utilities to go through a slow log and figure out what the big problems of a site are and go into views and try to fix a view or fix a query in actual module code. Those are skills that are pretty, pretty widely held at this point. But what's, what I've seen not widely held is the approach of going to a site that is extremely slow and not just being bogged down in minutia. Like, I have clients that I've come to and the first 50 minutes of a contract with them is talking to their very skilled developers and system administrators about the perfect way to configure APC which is an opcode cache for PHP. That is very important, but once it's on and working, the minutia of trying to like, reduce its hits to disk is not something we should be talking about when there are 20-second you know, page loads on the site. APC is not going to fix that. It's not going to really impact that in a way that we should be talking about. And that knowledge of being able to address a site correctly from layer to layer to layer without letting yourself get bogged down in these little areas and trying to get the low-hanging fruit to make a site usable the quickest and make a site fit its goals the quickest is something I don't see talked about. So I'm gonna try to really focus on that here. Yeah. Um, and this is not a presentation. So this is one of the worst ideas I've ever had, I'm sure, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I have a few more slides past this, and then I'm gonna exit to a VPS that's running on my laptop that has a site that I have configured to be terrible. And we are going to debug it together. Uh, he's gonna come back and try to dim the lights. I don't, I don't know how to. <laughs> um, is this hard to read? Okay. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the first step is we are coming in either, you know, either we're a new hire to a company or we have a new client or we're just, we've finished development on a site and we need to do the, the performance work at this point or figure out why it's going so slow on the production server when it was fine on staging or something has changed and now it's really slow. Like there, there are a number of reasons for this. What the client or what your boss or what the users will always say is, 
it's slow, or the front page is slow, or it's down all the time. These are not useful metrics. Um, they, they fully believe they're useful metrics. Like, I'm not, <laughs> they're, they're trying to help, but it's not very useful. It's not really indicative of the problem in many cases. It's a good start, but usually when I start talking to a client, I need to start getting a lot more details from them. What sites are slow is one that is a weird question, but sometimes they're talking about a site that is completely different from like their front page or their main site. And I have gotten like 45 minutes into an engagement before they pointed that out. So I just want to mention that. Um, what pages are slow? Is it slow for anonymous users? Is it slow for authenticated users? Do you only have anonymous users? What is the load pattern for the site? Is it 50-50 anonymous uh, authenticated? Is it 80-20? Is it, you know, five to six people on the site all the time until a commercial comes up and then hundreds? These are all questions that need to be asked at the beginning because otherwise you're just going into a site that is incredibly complicated. It's Drupal, it's stacks of modules and themes on top of that, it's PHP, it's Apache, it's possibly Varnish, it's possibly Memcache, MySQL, the operating system beneath that. Is the hardware virtualized? Is the hardware virtualization done right? Is the SAN that the hardware virtualization is back-ended to overloaded? These are too many questions to address just all at once. Limitations are good in design, in engineering, in almost everything. And the first conversation with whoever the stakeholder or client is for a website that I have is trying to find those limitations. So if they're going to say it's all anonymous, that's a huge limitation that is extremely useful. If they're going to say anonymous users load the site in under a second and authenticated users load the site in 25 seconds, that's incredibly useful information. That means caching is working. That means that if anonymous users aren't complaining, their cache hit rate is high. Maybe they're not posting uh, articles that often. Maybe block caching would be useful. These are all things that you get from these conversations that are very important to have, and honestly, I'd say just as long as possible. As much as we hate meetings, the longer you can talk to a client about exactly what the load patterns and goals for a website are before you start performance analysis is extremely useful. Um, and take notes, even though I'm terrible at that. So we define goals and load patterns to maintain focus. For our example, here is our goal and our patterns. We're going to say that it's split down the middle. We have 50% anonymous users, 50% authenticated users. This is by far the worst case, um, just because you have no one, way, one place to focus. And the anonymous users are just as important as the authenticated users because they lead to new users, but the authenticated users, let's say, are paying, so we can't ignore them either. And our goal is 800 millisecond latency. That means from the time that the request starts, we want that first bit of data of the actual site to be delivered within 800 milliseconds. Note that this does not take into account front-end rendering time at all. Uh, we're not going to talk about that at all. That is its own presentation, its own conference. It's, no. So we're just going to talk about the Drupal actual bootstrap and page output, which is also extremely important, which is why it's often focused on. So our first step is we've had this conversation with the client. We have some load times, some complaints about specific pages, some ideas about load patterns, and now we need to step away from the client and assume that they just lied to us. That everything they said is wrong. And in fact, that they have never been to the page and are visiting Google and reporting those results. So we're going to start that. Our site is Drupal 7. It's views, flags. The content is develop generated. It's, um, there's about 600,000 nodes, about 100,000 users. So it's a fairly large site, and it's larger than I wanted it to be. Um, because if you're going to do this sort of presentation, I highly recommend you don't put an SSD in your laptop before you do. Um, <laughs> it's amazing how quickly SSDs can do full table scans. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to exit out of this now, and here's our site. Now I'm going to use Firefox for this. You can use Chrome, Savari, whatever. Uh, 
the important thing is you need something like either Firebug or Chrome Developer Tools or Safari Web Console or something like that. Um, you need a net console to show how quickly the front page is loading and how quickly the resources are loading and the headers for all of those things when you're going to start looking at the performance of sites. So here's our front page. The first thing we're going to do is say, okay, the client said the front page was slow. Let's load the front page. And while it's loading, I'm going to note that I loaded it before. And so it is slow. It's 8.23 seconds. So it's actually extremely slow. That's the point where users start leaving the site. Actually, that's beyond the point. But at this, at this level of slowness, new users are only going to stick around if they have an invested interest in coming to the site. And basically, there's going to be no, no users coming in just because they thought it looked cool. Those people aren't going to wait for eight seconds. Also, your Google uh, page rank is going to go down from this. And likely, your servers are going to go down when they get load. OK, so we're going to start actually taking some notes here. So that took about eight seconds to load. We were also told that there's a gallery feature and that that's terrible. And so we're going to load that. And while that's loading, we're going to load an article page. Why we're doing this is because oftentimes you'll get instances where a client doesn't realize what they're actually doing. For example, uh, the best example I have is old Drupal 6 sites with the admin toolbar turned on, or admin menu, I guess is what it's called. Admin menu actually makes sites pretty slow in some cases, and oftentimes a client won't realize that what they're seeing, for example, just uh, if anyone's used admin, admin bar, there's a place where you can switch users and it lists all the users by role. Um, that's an incredibly bad query. So like, sometimes uh, clients don't realize that their site may actually be performing fine and they just don't know. Uh, this is not one of those cases. This, this page just took 23 seconds to load. Uh, this page just put, took 12 seconds to load. And now we're going to log in. And so we update this because we're going to do everything very, very strict. I'm not going to load this, but that is also 12 seconds. They're, they're basically the same page. Um, and once we log in, we have a favorite content uh, view. And the client has also reported that this favorite content view, while it's pretty, pretty required from a feature perspective, people are reporting that it times out and it's just, it doesn't load in time at all. And we're seeing that right now because it took it took 13.4 seconds to load. So now we have some validation. At this point, it's very tempting to turn on the develop query list, go to these pages, and go through every SQL query there and try to figure out what the query is that's causing this problem. And I'm guilty of this all the time. Like this is. It seems like the natural step, but the problem is that it doesn't represent what might actually be going on. Like, for example, what if there's a block that's cached some of the time, but in some cases does run and is slowing down the site? And that's what we're seeing, and that's what people are reporting. But if we reload this in the develop query list, we might not see it. And then we have to start iterating on that specific page, and suddenly it's already done. We're already locked into a specific page. We're looking for a specific query, and we're not doing an overview anymore. And we're going to miss things. We're going to miss things that might be extremely low-hanging fruit that we can fix very quickly. And it's just one of those areas that I'm going to point out repeatedly of times where I'm tempted to skip and go to something in particular when I really should be zooming back out to try to look at the big picture again. It's almost never incorrect to stop what you're doing and relook at the big picture. The things. You'll, you'll waste time. You'll definitely waste time. But the one in five times where you zoom out and find this piece of low-hanging fruit that is on every single page and runs you know, 12,000 times a minute and is taking a huge amount of time is well worth the time you might waste by it while zooming out to try to fix something when you could have just gone in and fixed it right there. So we know now that there's definitely some bad queries on this page, likely. It's taking a long time to load. 
So what we're going to do is not assume that they're bad queries, but we are actually going to go in, and I already have devel enabled, but I do not have any of the devel options enabled. We're going to go in and say display the query log. We're going to go in and say display the page timer, display memory usage, and save. And now we're going to reload just the front page because we're zooming back out to try to make sure that in the page timer, all we're doing here is we want to look at the page timer and make sure that the SQL query time is dominant. Because we think that queries are the problem here, but we don't know that queries are the problem here. And before we switch on to the MySQL server to see what's going on, we need to know. And here it is. We have confirmation that queries are the problem. Queries themselves are taking 8.5 seconds on the home page. Now, Again, it's tempting to scroll down here and start looking at why, and I would advise you not to. In this, ca in this particular case, it would work. But in the general case, it's not a good idea. So now we're going to go over to the actual VM this is running on. Uh, how many people have used the MySQL slow log in any way? Great. How many people have used a slow log analysis utility? Great. OK, so we're going to use something called the Percona Toolkit. Um, it used to be called MatKit. Before that, it was called something else. I'm hoping they don't change the name next year. Um, and what we're going to use is PT Query Digest, which is a tool that you point to a slow log, and it does analysis over the slow log, giving you a list of the top slow queries, aggregate. So it, this is much better than just looking at a slow log, because you get an aggregate view of queries by count and queries by execution time, and it even biases it. So if a query runs 20 times but takes you know, 30 minutes in total, and another query runs 5,000 times and takes in total about five minutes, it's still a bad query. The one that runs less but takes more time is going to float to the top above that one. And that's something that's useful, because for a while, these query digest applications actually favored count a lot more than runtime. So we're going to make sure that the slow log is enabled. And it is, and it's set for a long query time of two seconds. I would probably set it to one, but it doesn't really matter for this case. Can you increase that size? Yeah. How's that? <laughs> How about that? OK. This is what a PT Query Digest looks like. Right here is a summary for everything. It's semi-useful, but not really when you're looking for a problem query and you already know that your queries are bad. Um, that is useful if you're going to run this on cron and have it emailed to you. And it can kind of tell you when things are going off the rails. This is now too small. Um, this is one of the most important parts. These are the ranks for slow queries by their time total, the number of calls, and the, and the uh, app dex score, which is actually fairly cool. That's a new addition. And so we're going to go through this. And we see here's our first query. Every query will have a query time distribution. And it actually tells you the distribution mm -hmm. of how long this query runs. Because a query will sometimes vary by the arguments you give it. Actually, quite often, it will vary by the arguments you give it. For example, uh, the most common case is, is if you have a listing of content by author, for example, on a user page. Uh, if you have a admin user that is going to migrate in a bunch of content from an old site, and you accidentally make that admin user own all of the migrated content, it's very likely that that query is going to perform extremely poorly for the admin user, but fine for everyone else. So this allows you to actually see if that's the case, um, which is very useful because, again, it prevents you from wasting time. So going down here, we see that this is SQL no cache and it's a straight select, so this is likely a backup job. So we're going to skip it and go down to this one. So this is our first real slow query. And I'm not going to expect everyone to look at this and know where this query is or know what it might be or even how to fix it. Basically, what I want to do is show everyone how to find it here and possibly report it, 
definitely keep an eye on it, like know what this is, know, ha have this open in another window for our next step so that we can, we can map this query to where it is on the site so that we can figure out that, okay, this is our top real query and it occurs on these pages. And just that piece of information is extremely useful and much better than this page is slow and of course much, much better than the site is slow. And at that point you can go either try to fix the query yourself or try to find someone to give you help in fixing the query and it's a big jump forward. But, so we have this. The big thing I note here is order, order by node comment statistics, last comment timestamp. Um, I'm likely to use that to identify this query and we're gonna go on. This is pretty much the same query above but you see it's select count star. Basically when you see that you immediately think this is a pager query and this is the count to show how many pages could be in this pager. Amusingly, this is one of the uh, worst culprits in standard websites that have complicated views and lots of data. A lot of times a solution for a view that is performing poorly and can't really be fixed is to turn on what's called the light pager, which is a module that sadly has not been fully ported to Drupal 7 yet. Uh, there is a patch that you can apply. But for Drupal 6, uh, it exists. And all it does is it doesn't run this select count. It just says next page. So instead of saying one, two, three, four, dot, 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 and then the end page, it just says next. And with that little difference, it can actually make a huge impact on performance. Because the first query that runs has a limit on it. And that limit allows MySQL to optimize it in very interesting and really effective ways. Whereas the actual count query, not so much. Uh, views light pager. Views underscore light pager, one word. Um, at the moment, you wait for views light pager to be ported. But also, for views for Drupal 7 is a little bit smarter. So that's nice because it actually, for that count, oftentimes it'll remove the order by, which is very nice. Um, but for now, I, I've, I've actually used light pager and with that patch, there's an issue open for porting it to D7 and it works and the patch is very limited. So if you really need it, you can likely just patch it. Uh, I would expect a release soon because it is actually fairly widely used. Okay, next one, this. And again, like you look at this and you've got no idea what the hell this is. But what I want you to do is either have, you know, I can identify this by this right here and that's what I'm gonna do. But what I'd recommend is you have a text editor open and just copy these, like the top four queries if they're dominant for a site into the text editor so that in our next step and in your next step, you'll be able to identify them and map. Okay, this is in the slow log and it appears on these pages. That's a very crucial step to this. So that's our, that's our third real query. And this is our fourth. Um, and this one I'm again gonna identify by this right here because it's actually, this is actually pretty identifiable. Um, but again, what you do is copy this to a text editor. And this is actually a duplicate. Um, you're gonna have to look for these. These uh, slow query analysis tools often will, they're very good for what they do but a lot of times they'll not be able to match something exactly, especially with how Drupal does it. So there might be duplicates and you just, you just kind of have to look at the query and go, oh, that has all the where conditions joins, same joins, same type of joins, and same order buys as that query up there. And here's another pager query that we're going to note but kind of ignore, and that's it. Those are the only slow queries. So we have a few pager queries and basically three other queries that we're interested in here. And at this point, the difference might seem a little small, but instead of going through the develop query listing per page, we now absolutely know these are the three slow queries. They're completely dominant in the slow log. The slow log is, is gonna contain everything over two seconds in this example, and our pages are loading in eight seconds or more, so that's gonna be good for us. And now we can go back and go to the query listing per page and figure out exactly what these are. So we're gonna go on the front page and we're gonna start scrolling down. And we're gonna see 153 milliseconds, I don't care, we're way above that. Six, I don't care. And we're gonna keep going and bam. 
five seconds, two seconds. Here's the pager query, here's the regular query. And we can see that this is a view, views plugin, which makes our job much easier. We're now going to just scroll through the rest of this to make sure that there isn't something else and there isn't. So now, because this is views, we got a break, which is the last time I'm ever gonna say that from a performance perspective. <laughs> so we're gonna go into structure and views and settings and advanced. And we're going to add view signatures. And then we're going to reload. And what we're going to see is that now there is this right here, the signature. So this is tracker block one, and that's the break. If it's a view, we can turn on view signatures and know exactly what it is. And that's amazingly useful, especially for Drupal 7 because everything is done through a query builder, and it's very, very hard to find things in the query builder. So now you get to know exactly what view is the problem. In this case, it's the tracker view. And what you'd probably do is either ask someone for help, go through the issue queue, or just Google search, because actually tracker is a pretty uh, common query to have problems. And what you'll probably see is, hey, you don't need the pager. And the pager's a problem. And hey, you might want to cache it. And safe. And so what that's going to do is this v the query is still terrible. I, the tracker query is terrible. Um, there's a way to fix it. It's called tracker2. But um, by default, it's, it's awful. But now we're not running that pager. And on the second load, this block is going to be cached. And this block appears on every page. So j just with disabling the pager, we've cut out two seconds. And with it cached, we've cut out a total of seven seconds from every page load. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to favorite content and do this one, and then I'm going to back out of uh, SQL for a bit. Um, the favorite content page is one of the problems that was highlighted by our client, and we saw that there were a few, we saw that there are a few SQL queries in the slow log. One of them is actually this. Um, one of the things I highlighted was an order by flags, and that's often what the favorite content, any sort of favorite content, view, page, block, is likely going to be flag-based. So we see that that is exactly that. Here it is, order by flag content. This is exactly the line that I, uh, I highlighted in the slow log. So in this case, this is one of those areas where, OK, this is a lot of content. That seems like too much content for me to have actually favorited. I'm going to go in here, and one of the biggest mistakes I ever see is that this isn't actually showing favorited content. It's showing all content sorted by your favorites at the top. This is an idiom that is almost impossible to make perform without writing your own module. What I recommend is to have a listing of content and then a listing of flagged content and keep them separate. And then this relationship include only flagged content. And that will actually just full on fix this. Uh, it doesn't really have much to do with my methodology here, but I wanted to include it because I've seen it so often. <laughs> um, it's an extremely easy change to make, and just having two listings of views usually doesn't break a feature. Okay, so we've made two changes. We've removed the pager from the tracker view, and we've made this only list flagged content. Now we're going to stop and back out. We're going to back all the way up and see what the impact was on these pages. And basically just go back to our global view 
and make sure that these changes we made are A, helping, and B, there isn't something else that is a problem. So the first thing I see is that took too long. Like, we should have fixed that. This is six seconds, and it was 13 seconds, so that's better. But six seconds is still too much. And we're going to look here, and the query time is still pretty high. The execution time is higher. That's weird. And then I'm going to start looking through here and see that things are looking a little bit odd. These are a lot of registry calls. These are a lot of path calls. Wait a minute, we fixed this, this should be cached. So at this point, I back out again and go check the caching settings. And while there isn't a minimum cache lifetime set, which there should be, and we're not caching for anonymous users, that shouldn't impact any of the things I just saw. So I'm gonna fix those make a note of that, go no further in this. I'm not gonna set up varnish, I'm not gonna do anything like that because I just found something that's a global issue that I need to continually back out and try to find the solution for. So now I'm gonna back all the way out of SQL. Even though there are still bad queries, we're going to note that there are still bad queries and back out. And I'm gonna use something called xdebug. xdebug is a PHP peckle module. <laughs> And you install it, it's, a, it's in IUS or EPL if you're using CentOS, it's in pretty much every distribution at this point somewhere, and you can install it easily, and then what I do is I enable the trigger. If you don't do this, you're gonna have to enable it globally, and trust me, you don't want to. So the trigger allows you to append this to our URL, and then that URL be, will be run through xdebug. So let's do that. The other thing I'm gonna show you is that I have put web grind, and if you just Google web grind, it's the first hit. And this is, I think, the easiest way to look at this output. And I just stuck it in the web root. It's very easy to install. You literally just stick it in the web root. And all it does is it looks for these cache, gr cache grind files that xdebug produces in temp. And so it'll, it'll automatically just pick the newest one, you just open up web grind, press update, and it'll parse it, and that's all. So how many people have ever seen this screen before? Fantastic, okay. So the first thing I notice here is, yeah, we clearly still have some query problems. What I also notice is these two lines. Now, I don't necessarily want everyone, or I'm gonna say that everyone should be able to instantly look at this and pick out those lines. More, I want you to just keep, keep poking at things that don't look right and keep zooming back out, to, all the way back out to the original page load time and trying to work your way back in to figure out what the actual problem is. So one thing you should note is memcache connect should never ever be this high. And that theme process registry really should only run once unless caching is broken. And we already saw that we've cached a block and it's having no impact. All of that put together means caching seems broken. So let's check our settings. We're using memcache, okay. Let's try to connect to memcache. You can use Telnet for this. You just Telnet to the IP and then the port. Well, that doesn't look promising. Is memcache running? Yes. Is the firewall running? Yes. Do any of these ports look like the memcache ports? No. So we have no caching is what we took away from this. There may be easier ways, like there are definitely faster ways to find this. You could just decide that for every client you go to, you're gonna audit their firewall. But that's fairly difficult to do. Sometimes it's impossible to do. And that doesn't account all the other issues that you might hit on a standard client engagement or any sort of engagement. Whereas what we just did, no matter what the issue is, if we keep backing out and going, okay, it's not, it's not a query because we cached that query. We're looking at PHP execution time and we're seeing something weird. If you just keep doing that, no matter what the issue is, you're going to find it and you're not gonna have to have these list of one-off things that you're always gonna check. 
Everyone will have that list to some extent, but it's not something you should count on. So suddenly, things are looking a lot better. This page is loading much, much faster. If we go down to the develop query listing, we're seeing that, hey, there are a lot fewer, uh, lot fewer uh, calls here that should be cached. But look at this, there's still a bunch of registry calls. So, and what I just did is wrong. So what I just did is I looked at, oh, there's a bunch of registry calls, and what I was about to do is go look at the theme. Because in my head, I have a rule that says if the registry keeps being rebuilt, someone somewhere has put a registry rebuild in the theme. That is not something you should do. And it's something that I still do, clearly, because I almost just did it there. But what we're actually going to do is we're going to run web, web grind again. It's that easy, by the way. You just refresh web grind, and it'll find the newest file. Hey, look, memcache connect is not here. File scan directory seems weirdly high. Registry check seems weirdly high. Registry parse files. This is wrong. If you just look at this, this looks wrong. The registry is being rebuilt. So now we can back up and go, OK, I validated what I think is happening. And what I'm going to do is look in my theme, which in this case is Bartik, and look for a registry call. And I've helpfully even highlighted that it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so I'm going to delete that. I'm going to restart Apache, because it's one of my ticks to make sure that APC isn't caching completely. And we're going to go back not run the profile this time. Reload it twice to load the cache and look. No registry calls. So now clearly that was completely contrived. But <laughs> how I showed how to actually find it is not. And that's what I'd do if I, if I hadn't caused the problem. That's exactly what I would do to back out and find it. So what we have at this point is a not We've focused on authenticated users. Authenticated users are now, now fast uh, for this page and for favorite content. I'm not going to touch gallery because I'm actually running out of time and it's kind of boring. Um, but basically what I do there is the exact same idea, is go to the develop query listing, match it to the slow log to make sure that we're looking at the right query. Because there might be another slow query on the, the gallery page. But if it's like a one second query and it's not in the top of the slow log, ignore it. It's not a low-hanging fruit. You'll get it on the next iteration. Just stay very iterative and only do exactly what you're trying to do and don't get distracted by other things. Make a note of them, but don't get distracted. So we're going to back out of this and make sure, because we've only covered authenticated users at this point, uh, mostly because anonymous users are easy. But we're going to make sure that, yes, anonymous page caching is working. And I was actually planning on going into setting up Varnish, uh, because I have it almost like, mildly set up. But it's 2.54, which means there are about 20 minutes left. And I really wanted to take questions. So I'm actually going to leave it up to you guys. Do you want me to cover just setting up Varnish to tune for uh, anonymous users? Or do you want to go to questions? OK. So at this point, I've gone through, I think, about two iterations. We've found that there were PHP execution time problems, mainly the registry rebuilding. We've gone through the slow log. We have not tuned MySQL, you might note, because we went through the slow log and found actual real slow queries, and that was the low-hanging fruit. Tuning, in this setup, actually, MySQL is tuned horribly. Uh, this is an IONODB site, and it's using, I think, 8 megs of buffer pool. It's terrible. But that's not the low-hanging fruit, and we're going iteratively and strictly trying to get the big problems and not focusing on the random stuff we find along the way. 
So what we're going to do is we're talking to the client. The client is happy with authenticated user performance now. It's under 800 milliseconds, and they don't really care anything beyond that. But they are unhappy that with anonymous users, it's fast, but it's not as fast as it could be. These are the new users coming in, and there's a commercial coming up, and they're not sure gonna, they're going to be able to handle the traffic. So we're back outing, backing out at this point and saying, OK, Varnish would help you a lot. So what we do, because this is Drupal 7, is first we're going to enable Drupal 7 to use Varnish. And having worked on Pressflow for a really long time, you have no idea how nice it is to just uncomment these two lines. So what this is, is the magical, almost undocumented uh, <laughs> tunables to make Varnish work. And mainly it's this one. This one you can set in the UI, but I tend to like setting it in settings.php because the, for some reason, people just go into the performance panel and just change things. So I like setting things in settings.php. At least then they get frustrated and then blame you. Um, no, so in Drupal 6, you're gonna have to use Pressflow. Uh, in Drupal 7, it's built in. Uh, in Pressflow for Drupal 6, basically the process is a, a little bit easier actually because you install Pressflow and then you go to the performance pane and everything's just there. There isn't a magic tunable. Um, you could argue, well, you could go to the Drupal 7 issue queue and find the actual argument pro and con that, <laughs> but, um, but that's how it is. So now Drupal will send the correct headers, basically. And what Varnish does is it proxies your request to Drupal, and Drupal says to Varnish, hey, you can cache this page for this long, assuming this isn't true. And that assumption is it's saying vary on cookie. What that means is it's telling Varnish, hey, if a request comes in, and that request has a cookie, and your object in your cache has a cookie, unless those two cookies are the same, don't cache. So what we're going to do now is look at Varnish. I've already, I have already installed and configured Varnish, except I didn't configure it. What this is is actually copied and pasted off the Four Kitchens wiki. Uh, this is a VCL that, at this point, almost the entire community has contributed to. Um, I'm going to edit my slides and add the links to these various things I mentioned to the end of the slides and then put them on the node for this presentation. And this will be part of that. So all you really have to do is install Varnish, put this VCL in. The only part of this VCL you should really pay attention to is this. There are a bunch, uh, Varnish doesn't cache cookies basically, is the default you can think of. What this says is I'm gonna look at every request coming in and I'm gonna strip off the cookies I know don't matter to the back end. They don't make this request different. What makes this request different? The session cookie. If you have a dumb module, uh, I'm not gonna mention the name. If you have a dumb module that sets, uh, sets a cookie to decide something like showing a block and that's not in JS, that matters to the back end. Things like Google Analytics, things like a lot of packages that track paths through websites, that's all done in front end JS and you can strip those cookies and cache the request. So what you do is you basically, you add the identifiers to the cookies you want to strip to this little thing and they're separated by these pipes and it's just a regular expression. It's very simple. At this point, you can look and Varnish is configured to listen on port 80. And if you look back at the VCL, by default, it wants Apache, the back end, to be on port 8080. So all we have to do is go into the Apache configuration, search for the listen line, which is here, which decides Apache's port, and set it on 8080. Then we restart Apache, restart Varnish, or start Varnish. <laughs> yes. If you have a virtual host that has its own listen directive, you're going to have to change that as well. What he said is to make sure that your virtual hosts don't screw up the port. Um, and then if we go here, while it was fast before, and this is why Firebug is eternally useful, if we look, we see that X Drupal cache was a hit. 
we're passing through varnish now, and it was a miss. We're going to clear our cookies, because if I press force refresh, it's going to actually force refresh the cache. And it's still a miss. Nice. That's fine. Um, so that's OK. Here's how you debug that. Varnish has a utility called varnish log that actually logs the request. So we're going to make that request again. Oh, and it's uh, Firefox being stupid. So this happens a lot. <laughs> Browsers have decided that they're not going to respect anything anymore, um, which is just fun. So we did hit. You can see it right here. Here's the request coming in. We do a lookup. We hash it. And we hit, and then we delivered. And it was a 304 not modified. So it worked. It just didn't show that it worked, because what happened is Firefox requested if the, if the data had changed, and it didn't. And Firebug right now, sadly, doesn't update the headers when that happens. So I don't know. It's just one of those things that if you're really unsure, just go look at Varnish Log. It's, it shows what is actually happening. Your browser likely doesn't, which is, if you're using Chrome, your browser just doesn't. Um, <laughs> Firefox is semi close to reality. Safari is actually wrong in some cases, like entirely, entirely wrong. Um, so if you're going to use Varnish, be very comfortable with Varnish log because it's absolutely your friend. So we're now using Varnish. We've backed up. We still have things left to do. Like uh, APC isn't configured at all, um, not in the slightest. Uh, MySQL is completely unconfigured, and we're basically reading everything off disk. But the page is fast. We could have spent exactly this time. We've been here for a little bit less than an hour. We've been here for like 45 minutes. We could have spent this time configuring APC. I can spend 45 minutes configuring APC, especially for Drupal 7. We could have spent three hours configuring MySQL. But because we did this iterative process continually making sure that we were absolutely focused on exactly the goal, we have a fast website without doing that. And we can either stop now and be happy that the site meets its goals, or more likely, we can iterate from here with a much happier client or much happier stakeholders and spend more time on these issues that matter. But I would still recommend, like even when you're going deeper at every level back out, and make sure what's happening works. For example, APC, uh, does anyone here know about the include once override for APC? OK. For those people that don't, um, the include once override basically, when configured correctly, makes it so that instead of Drupal touching all of its PHP files basically all the time, whenever it feels like it, whenever a wind really comes through slightly hard, um, APC will override those and make it basically touch the cache instead. You wouldn't think that would be a big deal, but a lot of places have, for example, their web routes on NFS, or they have pretty slow drives, or they're just having a huge amount of traffic. You can definitely throw enough traffic at a single web server that those little, those little touches on the disk start mattering. When you start configuring APC, you're going to realize that actually making that work is incredibly hard to do. And the only way to really do it is make a change, a single change, and back all the way out because there's no other way to make sure that things are actually working. In theory, it's two settings. In actuality, it's two settings, making sure you're not doing specific things with your PHP code, making sure the cache isn't doing specific things, making sure Apache is configured correctly. You have to keep backing out. And that was, uh, the goal for this presentation, I guess, was not really, along the way, I showed, you know, kind of fixing this site, uh, part way, showing the Bracona toolkit and how to go through a slow log, showing a little bit of how to set up varnish, showing a little bit of all these different ways. But the goal of this to try to, is to try to get across how I approach these sites and how I try to, I fail a lot, but how I try to maintain to this strict methodology of staying focused and continually looking globally. Because I don't see it done that often, and in my view, it's incredibly useful. So we have about 10 minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, 
Uh, he asked if the include once conflicts with PHP 5-3. Um, to some extent, honestly, the include once conflicts with almost everything. Um, you could say the same about APC, honestly. Uh, it's, it's an incredibly useful thing. Like, PHP without APC performs terribly, and it has performed terribly for a long time, but it's a hack, and it's the most enterprise-supported uh, maintained hack that I've ever seen, but it's still a hack, and you just run into problems. Include once override is an amazing thing that I was really excited about right up until I started using it, <laughs> which is depressing. It's why system administrators drink. Uh, so in the beginning, you uh, showed how to use slow log to identify mm -hmm. the, uh, the bad queries, but then you just went into um, Firebug, or not into Firebug, you turned on the, the option in the develop module to see the query. So why couldn't you just go directly to those queries on the develop page? Right, okay, so what I was trying to get across with that is that, um, so you can. You can turn on develop, the develop query listing and go through page by page to look at those slow queries. What you would have to do, is, and you can do it this way actually, what you'd have to do is you need to have a notepad or text edit or spreadsheet and you need to look at those queries, go through the pages and say, okay, this page has three slow queries, this page has four slow queries, this place has five slow queries, where do they overlap? Which one should I fix? These queries can take hours, days, weeks to fix. You need to be able to prioritize this or you're gonna be spending a huge amount of time on something that didn't end up mattering, which is, I, I'm sorry, I apparently didn't explain that particular point well because that was one of the points I wanted to get across is that it's fairly easy to open up develop query listing and go through and start fixing random slow queries, but what separates out someone who can come in and fix a site in a day from someone who can fix random slow queries is being able to find a way to prioritize what you're doing. And in my opinion, the slow log with something like PT Query Digest is the best way to do that. Um, so excellent talk, I was just curious, uh, uh, why you went with X, Xdebug and uh, WebGrind as opposed to XHProf? <laughs> um, yes, so he asked why I used Xdebug instead of XHProf. XHProf is a little bit newer than Xdebug and is much, much better in a variety of ways, in my opinion. Um, but it's a little bit harder to use. It's much, much harder to set up. It is at integrated into Devel, which is actually really, really cool if you want to look at. Um, you, can, you can set up XHProf and integrate it into Devel. So when you're going through your site, there's actually a little link on the bottom of the page that takes you directly to the query profile. Sorry, the code profile. Um, and that's really, really cool. But it doesn't compare, in my opinion, to just you know, installing something out of Peckle that's incredible. I'm sorry, installing something out of your distribution's uh, Yum repository or app repository putting a few lines into the INI file and throwing on a twi trigger and then throwing web, web grind into a web root. I, uh, trying to get easier than that is all pretty hard and that's what I wanted to show. But if you want to use XHProf, for, use XHProf. I know. <laughs> yeah, he was saying there's a Drupal module for it. It's actually integrated into Devel as well. Um, but while, so the theoretical instructions are that. In actuality, it can, you can run into significant issues with XHProf just because it's not integrated into the distribution package system. And that's why I went with this. Do you have a few um, like common or top MySQL uh, misconfigurations? Because I'm not a DBA, but I, you know, I find myself trying to make edits to some of the main configuration options there. So I don't know if you have a riff on, on that. By default, inodb, when these are commented out, has a buffer size of eight megs. Drupal 7 defaults to inodb. That's it, like that, there, there's your top one. Make your inodb buffer pool bigger. It's the single largest, single most important thing you can do to a MySQL server is to make sure that inodb covers your data space. That if you've got that down, you're ahead of the game. And Honestly, if I was to say one thing, that's the only thing I'd focus on. There's another um, tunable here that is the sync method. 
Um, you can, so if you go on Drupal.org and search for inodb and then sync method, um, you'll find a whole conversation on it. inodb by default runs in full acid mode, which means it tries to prevent any sort of data loss ever. And what that means is it, it syncs to the disk very, very, very often. Um, in particular, because by default it syncs on every commit, and Drupal commits a lot. Um, there are some numbers in the issue, but it's a huge performance impact when you actually make it, instead of syncing to the disk on every commit, sync every few seconds. And that's a big, big performance improvement. It is also not something that I like to say, just do this, because there are, there's a reason that's the default. Like, if you have bad hardware, I wouldn't do that. I, and you're gonna take a huge performance penalty. Um, and my answer would be fix your hardware. Um, but yeah, I would, I would say the one thing I'd say to everyone is make sure your buffer pool f uh, holds your data size and to a minority of people, look at the sync method, but understand what you're doing and understand that if there's a hardware failure, you're gonna be in trouble. I got uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is Xdebug suitable for uh, installation on a production server? No, okay. so the, uh, you don't install it on a production server at all. Um, what I would do, that's where you should use XHProf. XHProf was designed for that. It was designed by Facebook to do exactly that, to run on production servers and be able to be enabled or triggered or just run every so often. And it was actually built for that, whereas Xdebug was built as a development enhancement. So it's, I use Xdebug on staging Devel sites, but I never ever use it on production. Honestly, I wouldn't use XHProf on production either, but if I were to choose one, I would choose that. Gotcha, and, and the second question is, you mentioned like the views light pager module. Is, is there really a difference between that and like the, like the default views mini pager, which just has kind of the, the forward and next? It has the forward and, so I don't have time to show it. So it has the forward and it has the next, but it also has the last page. Uh, so it does count. Yeah. Which is unfortunate. I wish it didn't. Like, yeah. Uh, just a couple of quick comments, actually. Um, one thing that I've run into when trying to work with client sites often is full disks. And <laughs> if you want to talk about low-hanging fruit, a quick DF. Uh, yep. Oh, hey, you're at 97%. That's probably part of your problem. Yep. Um, and y usually it's log files, um, in my experience, or uh, backup database backups that haven't been cleared. Um, the second part, oh geez, I completely forgot what I was gonna say. Okay, well, I'll let it go at that. Okay, well, as a follow-up to your low-hanging fruit, here's another one. This is called VMstat, and it's the best utility in the world. Um, it shows many things, but the big thing is swap right here. In the low-hanging, on the topic of low-hanging fruit, if your server is swapping, all bets are off. So, <laughs> make sure it's not. <laughs> um, other than potentially running um, as HProf in production, uh, do you have any other tools or techniques that you recommend for trying to trace performance issues that only show up in production that are not reproducible in any other env environment? Um, yeah, so honestly it's a little difficult and what I tend to do is, it, what, I, what I tend to do depends on how much money is available. Um, <laughs> if, if there's a sufficient bank account involved, um, I'll often go and get a New Relic account, which is, I like it a lot actually. It, it's very cool, it, it lets you drill down into production systems, but um, it's a little buggy, honestly, in my experience. Like we've worked with them a lot, we, we work th with them on like five clients, and I think are a partner of some sort, but um, I, we've had to file bugs, it has caused issues, but if you just, I think there's a demo of some kind somewhere where you can use it for like a month, and if you just install it and look at what it provides, you'll quickly realize that there's very little else out there that provides that level of analysis. Um, the other thing I'll do is use either Cacti or Munin. Um, I like Cacti just because I co-maintain some of the graph templates with uh, Baron Schwartz, so I have an interest. But uh, Munin is much easier to set up, and I would probably recommend it. Um, and that doesn't give you performance analysis on an application level, but it does give you a lot of historical trends for your server. And for, for, for production servers, that's important for knowing, knowing when something changed, knowing when you're starting to head off the rails but are not off the rails yet, 
and just being able to track history, which you can then sort of try. You have that, you have your slow log, you have VM stat that you can run, and you can try to you know, combine them together and get an idea of what's going on. And that's usually what I use when you know, there isn't an Amex involved. OK, remember the other thing. Um, the other, the other low-hanging fruit that, that I have run into, uh, in fact, very recently in this last week or two, uh, is to look to see what else is going on in the server. Now, obviously, this is applicable with shared hosting, in which you have no control over it. But in, in our case, we had a very old, very low traffic, legacy PHP BB site on the same server. Nobody thought it was going to be an issue, and it wasn't, until Yahoo and Google decided to crawl it on the same day. And it killed the Drupal site on that server, and we had no idea why, because the Drupal site itself is running fine. You know, and we didn't see it until we dug into the slow query logs. Hey, two thirds of these are not even to the Drupal database. Yep. So, uh, in that case, I think the solution is is eventually going to be well, we're going to put that on a different server. Thank you very much. Um, but it is something to pay attention to. It may not be the Drupal site that you're trying to debug. Yeah, and like, I think one of the initial questions I said to ask the client is what site, and I think I also said assume they're lying. Um, and I think that's a good example of that. <laughs> um, and a good example of why sometimes you should just back out and look at the slow query log. Look at the global view for the servers. Logs don't lie until they do, but that's not an issue. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Thanks, everyone.